Hockey Canada is awesome at building programs. Hockey Alberta is too, where my background is for the most part. And I think Hockey Manitoba is too. Build us great stuff and then we give it to you and leave you alone. And you get to put it in place. That's not always so easy. Because you're just a volunteer. I hear that all the time. When I was a staff member, I hated that. I just thought, what do you mean you're just a volunteer? Well, I volunteer now as well, back in my community, not as a hockey coach, but I sit as a director as a major, of a major, um, it's called the Westerner Park, so it would be the same as whatever exposition group you have here in, in for example, Winnipeg that, that drives uh, the entertainment and, and the facility, big facility use in, in the community. And we just celebrated our 125th anniversary. And I'm sitting as a director and all of the things I do in sport around governance and visioning and values and strategic plans, we're 125 years old and we don't have any of that stuff. I can't believe it. And now, because we're trying to figure it out, we bring in a high paid consultant. I'm one of those high paid consultants that doesn't pay taxes or anything like that, or just a sprinkle income. No, sorry. <laughs> um, so bring in a high paid consultant and now we're going down that path of policy governance. Um, I know Hockey Manitoba is going down that and policy governance is really the board of directors is not operating the association. The CEO is operating the association and the board develops policies or, or ends as we call it, or boundaries or fences by which the CEO works in. Okay, and the board only has one employee that they worry about and that's the CEO. Well, you guys don't operate that way. You're an operational board, meaning you got your, as we call it, you got your fingers in the noodle bowl, so to speak. You guys are doing everything. And I think that's what makes it difficult, especially when you don't have things like roles and, and responsibilities and job descriptions and terms of references and all those kinds of things. So then it just becomes sometimes the loudest voice. Okay. That's not fun for a lot of people. Okay. So I'm hoping that today, by the time I share with you some of the things that, that I do uh, in the sport world, but also with small businesses as well, because a team is a team is a team. They just might have different um, ends or outcomes that they're looking for. Uh, than a sport team. But I hope that I can leave you with a couple of tools that you can use in Winnipeg, but you can also use in Sanford, or the two people I sat with last night where they have around 40 hockey players. So how many associations in the room have less than, let's say, 75 or 80 hockey players? You know, yeah, quite a few, the bulk of you. And so, boy, you're just trying to figure out, well, how are we gonna make two novice teams out of 17 hockey players or 19 hockey players and we only have 12 peewee players and the best two, well, they want to go down the, the highway to the next community. Some of the things that were, uh, comments were made last night. Um, sometimes I think, what the hell has changed over the last 30 years? Because those are the same darn issues we're talking about today that we were talking about in 1988, in 1990, in 1995. So what's changing, okay? Or what's not changing? And maybe it's just the people turnover, okay? Except for guys like myself and, and uh, Bob, and Don McKee, who you'll hear from later this morning. For me, it's a bit like a hockey reunion this morning because these are guys I've worked with in the game for the last, I don't know, since the mid 80s somewhere uh, when I first started in the game. I'm now one of those old white haired guys that are still making decisions about the game and still having an impact on the game. I kind of laugh when I say that, but I'm, I'm only 64, so I'm not that old, but I, when I get into communities, I'm now the oldest guy. I never thought I'd be that guy. It's kind of, wow, you kind of hope you're going to stay young and going to stay engaged in the game a whole lot forever. So I've certainly had to reinvent myself from a guy involved heavily in the coaching and mentorship side to more involvement on the governance side and working with, as I call it, the team at the top, the board of directors. Because if the team at the top isn't in very good shape, uh, the teams at the bottom are, even gonna, are gonna be even in worse shape. Um, 
So how do we, how do we, how do we do that? It's as simple as, for example, this morning. I don't have a clock on, so somebody's going to have to keep me on time here, I guess. Um, do you start your meetings on time? So you have a seven o'clock meeting on a Monday night, big agenda. What time do you start your meeting? Now, when I say the time, it's not important whether it's six o'clock or seven o'clock, but do you start at seven o'clock when you say the meeting's going to start at seven o'clock? Or do you start at 7.15 and reward the people who come late? Because that's what you're doing is rewarding the people that are coming late. So stop that. Start your meetings on time and end on time. So now as a volunteer, I'm even more worried about that because in my volunteer side, we do start on time, we never finish on time. Because depending on who's chairing the meeting, do they know how to run a meeting? Do they know what outcomes they want out of the meeting? So that le leads me back to what Todd Anderson said last night, kind of development for all, or we need more training and development for your level of people, and I agree. Okay, it goes back to my original issue uh, when I left Hockey Alberta in 99 and my frustration with building great programs and then giving them all to you and say, ah, great, good luck. It's really easy to do that stuff in your spare time. I mean, I, I don't have a whole lot of spare time to, to do some of those things that I would like to do. So I can imagine as well, um, many of you don't have a lot of that spare time. Work is asking for more time and more commitment. And plus, if you're in more rural Manitoba, or rural Alberta, the amount of driving time that it takes to participate in this game is incredible. So how do we ever get the work done uh, to make our associations as good as they, they can be. I, uh, when Mandy talked a little bit about visions, what's your vision for your minor hockey association? How, how many associations have a stated vision? Wow. So what are you doing with your program? Where are you taking it? Where is it going? I used to think when I first started that visioning, yeah, we're gonna vision something 10 years out. That's a little long. I'm a kind of a three, maybe a five-year guy because um, the world's changing really, really fast. So we'll try to, again, walk through some of those, those things here about visions and, and uh, strategic plans a little bit, portions of governance that are really important. I also want to make a, a comment. So I looked at the uh, presentations from last year, and I think Steve, it was Steve Norris, maybe. And I've heard Steve, I've worked with Steve Norris uh, I think the first time we hired him is he'd moved um, from the UK over to Canada and was talking to us about the early stages of long-term athlete development, and that was in the late 80s. But what got me out of the last video I saw was, was his frustration was, I've been doing this for 25 years, nothing's changing, what are you doing? Okay. We still violate every learning principle known to man. Any teachers in here? I know there's a couple, but we come at you and we have four or five verbal presentations last night. Yes, it's visual. Same thing today, nine presentations. How much are you going to take away from this? Okay, and what are you taking away from it? Okay. This pure listening isn't the best learning method. Okay. And me talking isn't the best learning method either. So, but we still do it that way. When I look at our HP1s, which is pretty significant training and development, we stuff so much information into you into a very small period of time, and now we tell you're an HP1 coach. <clears throat> well, I took my HP1, or my, at that time it was called Level 4 in 1977, but it wasn't probably until about 1986 or 87, it was 10 years later before, oh, so that's how it works. But I was already certified at that level. Um, I'm not sure if I could do it today. Um, certainly passing and all that sort of stuff I could do, but the amount of time we expect of coaches to put in, but also the amount of time that you put in um, under duress most of the time uh, is a challenge. So how can we make that easier for you? But I wanted to make that point of Steve Norris because I have the same issue as well. I tend to come into minor hockey associations when they're in trouble. 
and they can't figure it out. Well, we need to do some team building, and so I built a team building package. And, um, but it's not really team building that they need, other than if you get into the detailed definition of a team, which is a group of people working to, towards a common goal or, or set of goals. Um, so, you know, why no change? We've been doing this for years. What's happening? Um, I look at, uh, when we talk about governance and leadership, we look at leadership, Manitoba leadership, and I see some of the initiatives you're bringing forward this year. Half ice, bring a friend. Outstanding on the proper environment and the appropriate training. That is so important. You know, why are we teaching Adam hockey players two or three breakouts and they've got a power play and like, they don't need that stuff. An eye-opening experience for me over the last two years, I'm involved in mentorship. Hockey Alberta, we have these, it's called Alberta Cup, and first-year Bantams get selected into eight uh, zone teams, uh, and we go through a training process that we bring them towards the competition, the, and then the Western Hockey League makes their selections a couple months later. <coughs> but parents always were coming to me, because I was the mentor, well, what does my kid got to do? How does my kid make this team? And parents, and maybe some of you are in this boat, think there's some magic answer. Well, first of all, if you can't skate, you can't play the game, and that's just as simple as it gets. If your kid can't skate, he's not going to play, period. Okay? So teach your kids to skate, and that's why it's so important at the Adam and below. But that's your job as a board of directors to make sure that the coach is doing that job. Okay. And we'll make, have some more comments about that. But when I see that, and I pat and Manitoba Hockey on the back for doing what you're doing, but that's not new stuff. Why is it taking you so long to get there? And if I say some things and I upset a few people, well, that's good. George Kingston, who some of you will know, said to me once, Rick, if 50% of the, in his case, he was talking about players, if 50% of the players hate me, 50% of them love me, I'm doing awesome. So if half of you love me at the end, great. If half of you don't, I'm sorry. Uh, but that's not the end of the world. But I want to challenge you with a few of the things that you're doing or not doing to make a difference. And we don't have the same things we might want to do in Winnipeg are not necessarily the same things or the same depth of things that we might want to do in a Sanford uh, with much less numbers of hockey players. <clears throat> so to start off, your definition of success and leadership. So what's your success? So I asked a number of people what they're, where they were from, what, what uh, minor hockey association, what's your role? Um, how many players in your association? Well, what's success for you as, as an individual getting involved? How many of you have a bit of a pers your own personal plan? And Mandy made reference to that yesterday. What's, what's your vision for yourself? Now, I never started doing that until I was coaching the women's national team in 1990 and 92, and I want to coach the team in the 98 Olympics, or at that time it was 94. And I can remember the gentleman at that time saying, well, Rick, you got a lot of work to do to get yourself in position to have that team. And so he helped me lay out a three-year three, three year personal plan to get everything in order. And man, it worked just awesome. But I had a vision, and then we created a little bit of a plan. It wasn't too detailed, but it was just outlining all the things I needed to get to be in the position that I wanted to be in. Oh, unfortunately, I didn't get there, uh, but that's okay. But the learning that came out of it was the personal development plan. Do you have a little bit of an outline of what you want to achieve personally as a director in a minor hockey association? Now, why is that important? Why does somebody step up and volunteer in minor hockey? One, because they want to make a difference. They want to work with their kids. They love coaching or volunteering. But sometimes it's because you guys are doing such a bad job, I'm going to come in and fix it. And I'm going to fix it, what is it, October, no, it's September 30th here today? I'll have it fixed by at least the end of October, won't I? It doesn't get fixed too quick. So what, what's success for you? What's success for your association? 
How do you know if you're successful as a minor hockey association? Again, whether it's a small group of players or whether you have a large group of players, what is success? Is it keeping kids in the game? Is it getting more kids into the game? What is it? Who's your customers? Not the kids. It's mom and dad. And so don't force parents out of the game. You know, I always, when I see these statements and, and uh, sayings, banners, take your kids to the rink and leave them there and stay out of the rink, you know, because all parents are bad, right? How many are parents in here? Jeez, you guys are bad people, eh? I think we all want the best interest for our kids. Sometimes it's how we go about and doing it. But it's important to know who your customers are. And I think coaches need to understand that too. Yes, we're working with the kids, but I've always found that I've had great experiences when I incorporate those parents in with the hockey team, not leave them out there. So now we have rules. You can't talk with parents for 24-hour 20, rule. I can appreciate all that. I've never gone with that. If you have an issue, I'll talk with you after the game. But then again, um, I'm not 25 years old. I think a lot of young coaches come into situations and they don't have the life experiences and, and the skill sets to deal with me who, or the next guy down the road who's a 45 year old or he's 20 years older or whatever he is and has different experiences in life and maybe a bit more of a bully. So how do we help, help young kids and to coach and stay in the game? Okay. Um, what's success for your hockey teams? Is it winning? I was Im impressed with uh, the Minnesota um, presentation yesterday when, when you're, the amount of kids you're keeping in the games. I did uh, a, a project for Hockey Alberta looking at female hockey. And of course, certainly in, and I don't know the extent of it in, in, in um, Manitoba here, but certainly in Alberta and British Columbia, academies and sports schools are the ones that are driving female hockey right now. And I think that's probably happening in Ontario as well. Well, what do you do as a small organization to keep young girls in your community as opposed to sending them down the road? So what is success for your teams? What's leadership? It's doing the right things. Okay. Who does leadership? Certainly the board does leadership, but coaches have to be leaders as well. Kids have to be leaders. Do coaches provide opportunities to be leaders? And how do we go about being leaders uh, in our communities and in minor hockey? Sometimes it's difficult to lead. You know, if we don't have any followers, we, we're not a leader. Okay? So how do we get people to follow us as an organization? So I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts and tools here, and so we'll get going here now. <clears throat> Sport governance. It's the way in which you govern yourself, and it's the rules you follow as a board of directors. When we look at the number of appeals that happen in this province, which blows me away, um, I think there were some 30 appeals to the provincial body last year. In Alberta, we're just around 20. So what, why in Manitoba and why in Alberta such a difference in the numbers of appeals. And certainly appeals seem to be happening more around player movement. But when we look at sport governance internationally and nationally, it's getting to be a problem. If you were to do a Google search on um, sport appeals in Canada, now you wouldn't see things that are happening necessarily at this level, but I think you get challenged with the same ideas. It's all about the player that didn't make a team, whether a swimming team or gymnastics team or all of the uh, individual sports within a team sport, as opposed to, you know, we don't see the same kinds of appeal at the national level on, on hockey teams or, or football teams, those kinds of things. They're mostly the individual athletes. But what most of the appeals seem to come down to is the lack of process for picking players and the coach not following the process that he or she said they were going to follow to select a player for that team. How many of you guys have that problem? Okay. How many of you have an identified process to evaluate and select players? Awesome. Don McKee and I were talking last night. 
Coaches don't know how to evaluate players. And what are they looking for? Even in Alberta with our high performance programs, there are so few of the players or the coaches we bring in that can really do a good job of evaluating. And what tends to happen is I'll sit with my four buddies here who are also evaluating, we'll all sit in one corner and watch as if we're the, the great experts of, of hockey and we're gonna be picking, picking players. We wanna separate ourselves from the parents and not show them anything, don't include them in the process. Not that we wanna include all the parents in, in evaluation processes, um, but how are you doing it? And are you following what you said you were gonna follow is the biggest issue I see in the game, okay? Player evaluations are actually quite simple, but it comes down to can they skate? And, and now I think the big movement on, I think you see it even at the professional levels, character and habits. And I know I'm off of sport governance and leadership, but we keep looking for something that really isn't there. Character and habits. How does the kid treat, treat others? Okay. Is he working hard every single time? Is he doing the things he or she needs to do to be successful, character, and habits. If he's a Bantam age hockey player, does he like to go and have a, stay out late at night? Or maybe he's a midget player, and well, every now and then we like to get the gang together for some beers, whatever. Those aren't great habits if you want to be a successful hockey player. So habits of showing up on time, habits of young kids of proper nutrition, those kinds of things. Those are the things that make the difference. Not whether he scored, got a scoring championship last year, so he should be first on the team over here. Can he skate and play the game? What are his character and what his habits? And coaches need to look at those things. They're easy to see. When I go and watch a hockey game, I'm only looking at body language to see what kind of player Nolan is. Okay, how does Nolan respond to me, sorry Nolan, I'm putting your buddy Greg out there, uh, you're not gonna get out this shift, you know, because your mom peed me off yesterday by questioning why you weren't on the power play or whatever. Um, how you run in your organization? How are your coaches running the organization? How many of you are a boss, a supervisor, own your own company? Okay. Would you hire somebody in your company and then let them just go to work the next day? You give them whatever you're gonna give them, or her, and then they get to go and do whatever they want? That's what we do in minor hockey. We hire a coach, and then because he's been trained, we give him our kids, our most valuable resource, and he can go and do, now I'm being a little bit exaggerated, he can go and do whatever he wants. That's scary. You don't do it in your own company, why would you do it with your kids? Governance. The highest levels of fairness, transparency, stakeholder engagement. Are your evaluations fair? Are kids getting a fair opportunity to play and participate? Are coaches being fair? Transparency. The first things I tell associations when you're, you're um, doing your player evaluations is get the process up on the wall. Let parents see when you're going to make your selections. What are you looking for at the Adam level or PB level or Bantam level? What are you looking for in this practice? I've even done where associations have brought me in to set up a program. Let's let the parents evaluate. I give them a different colored sheet of paper. They don't know that. But what the importance of giving those evaluation forms to parents is that so they can figure out how difficult it is to see all the kids. It's easy to see the ends, the weakest players, and the greatest players. Anybody could pick them. We would all pick the same players. It's the 10 players looking at those three positions in the middle. How do we pick those? but it's so very difficult to see those players sometimes. And so by giving parents an evaluation sheet, different colored or coded differently, asking them to put them in, and then 
leave it alone or have a conversation with them. But it isn't easy to pick hockey players. We look at national teams here. Here, people are upset when this guy doesn't make our national team or the Olympic team or the women's program, or I'm sure in your high-performance programs, can Winter Games, etc. People are upset because they didn't make this team or that team. Well, why not? Okay. Are you consistent in your processes and your decision making? How do you make decisions? Or does the president make all the decisions on his or her own? Does that happen? Okay. You got to get that guy under control. Best practices. There are so many best practices out there. Which ones are the best? And what's best in Winnipeg isn't necessarily what's best in, in southern Manitoba. Okay. But you need to have an appreciation for what is going on out there to, and take what you need or what you can use and incorporate it into your, your business. Are your organizational affairs in order? Okay. How many people have a set of bylaws that are up to date? Meaning, let's say you've revised them in the, within the last three years or so, maybe we'll give you five years at the outside. Awesome. Or are there some, as we would say in Alberta, you're still on Ag Society bylaws? Bylaws are really important. They're really your protection as a board member, or as a volunteer director in an organization. They are, it is your protection, as long as you're following those bylaws and rules in terms of how you govern yourself, okay? or how you're disciplining a member in your organization. Okay. As a volunteer director, and I'm sure many of you have heard this and, uh, because of your background, but legal code stress two, two elements of fiduciary responsibility. You must be loyal. So you're loyal to Winnipeg Minor Hockey Association or Sanford Minor Hockey. Not to myself, I'm not there to make things that benefit me. I'm there to take care of the organization, the association, make it better, improve it, do whatever. Okay? So your loyalty. Okay? Prudence. Proper care, skill and diligence to the decisions that you make. Okay? Now, depending on your background, that's a moving target at times, okay? Because of my background and training, the, the level of responsibility I have when I'm working as a volunteer in sport is quite a bit different probably than most of you. And same as Bernie's responsibility would, uh, and, and, uh, it would be a little bit higher uh, in terms of the eyes of the law than would be somebody who doesn't have his background. When I look at the fiduciary duties, when I finish coaching the national team and I come back, my kids are now coming into novice category. My youngest kid was novice, the older kid was an Adam, that was great. I had an experience with the half ice situation. So this is 1994, it's a long time ago. Sorry to go back so far, but when I see you're doing this, the same things we were doing back then, Maybe it isn't that far apart. My kid is going into Pee Wee as a goaltender. They wanted me to coach so bad the Pee Wee AAA team in Red Deer. The president phones me up and says, yeah, we want you to coach that team and your kid can be one of the goaltenders already. Man, was I ticked. So disappointed. Yes, you want me, but, and I guess it's going to be good for me. I don't think it's going to be good for my kid. He's not capable of playing at the Pee Wee triple A level, but what about, what harm am I doing in the community? So I said, no, I'm not going to do it. Even in Red Deer, it wasn't even a small community at that time. I had more phone calls. What are you, are you stupid? Your kid can be a goaltender on that team and you could, but I just felt because of my background as a technical director and all of my involvement in the game saying, you need to do these things. How could I do that? So that comes to my fiduciary duty. And it is important. Your first responsibility is the organization. 
So governance, yes, it's the way you govern yourself, but there is some content, I think, to governance that should be in place in your organization. To the depth that you need is gonna be different everywhere. Vision, mission, and values. It is important to have a vision. What are you trying to do? Now, I think my first experience with visions is that uh, this great vision and we're gonna work for it. We never really get there and it's in the future. Well, no, it isn't in the future. Today, visioning, I think, is that at best five years, maybe six years before maybe it has to be adjusted. But you should have a vision for your minor hockey association for this year. What are we trying to do? Okay. Never mind the three and, and let's say a five-year vision, which may or may not be changed, but you should have some sort of an idea of where you're going. Okay. We want the same thing from coaches too. What's your vision? for this team. We look at vision, mission, and values. Are you achieving and living them? So how would you know? Now I asked that question earlier. What is success? So how do you know if you're moving towards your vision, which is over there? How would you know? What are you measuring? Okay. What are your key success factors? Well, in your organization, it should be happy parents and kids. Kids are staying in the game. Okay. We're retaining our volunteers. It's, it should be those kinds of things. If it's winning provincial tournaments or winning the league, well, those shouldn't be association big goals. That's at the team level. Plus, if you do all those other things that make it a great place to be, you will have a higher chance of achieving whatever it is over here if you do these things right. Do you measure how many do a little bit of an evaluation at the end of the year? And I'm not talking about evaluating your coaches. Do you evaluate your board? How'd it work last year? Well, we started out with 10 board members and at the end of the year, we we're down to three or four. Why? You need to know that. A plan with priorities and year-end reviews. What are you working on this year? Or are you just going through the motions? And when I say going through the motions, I don't mean that to be negative. Okay. What are you working on? for our organization this year to make it better. Well, you know, we're really working hard the last couple of years to update our policies and procedures, okay? We really need to improve our coach development program, so we're, we're looking and bringing in experts to talk to us about how we can incorporate a mentorship program for our young kids. Those are the things I wanna hear, okay? But those things are all in addition to what you do day to day. I mean, just being the registrar and the president and vice president, development director, and all the other directors that may go along, that's a full-time job already. And then we want you to do a bunch of other stuff on the side? What do you mean you gotta work? No. Can't you do that work at work? And, and I'll, I'll come to a little bit more on that a little bit later. Terms of reference for boards and committees. So. Who picks your players? Do you have a committee that oversees the player evaluation process or coach selection process? Or you just let me do whatever I want because I got a whole bunch of experience. And so, yeah, we'll just let Rick kind of do that. Well, that's great. I'll just go do whatever I want. And it may be great for the organization or it may not. Okay, but again, um, what do you have in place? Job and role descriptions for staff directors and especially the president. Now I'm only gonna focus on the president because I'm not a believer that the president should be coaching and be president also of the Minor Hockey Association. Because if he or she has those two roles, which one is he or she gonna focus on? Which one? Coaching, coaching, because coaching whether it doesn't matter which level you're coaching, it is, it's a big job. So I'm not a believer. I might offend a few of you saying, well, in our community, we don't have enough coaches stepping forward. We don't have enough volunteers stepping forward. So sometimes you gotta have two roles or three roles. I appreciate that. I don't have a magic answer for you. But I don't believe at least your president shouldn't be coaching. I think that's too important of a position. 
and too much stuff to know and participate in with branches that he or she cannot do both jobs. And so if he's coaching, then the association is not getting better. My belief, my experience. Expectations for coaches and volunteers. So job description for a coach, absolutely. What do you want, expect of that coach at the novice level? The peewee level, bantam level, whatever levels you have in your community. You should have a, we'll call it a job description, but I, d I don't always like that term. You should have a set ex of expectations for your coaches and you should be monitoring them because they work for you and you are responsible. You know, today there are so many issues in the game that you need to know the coach is doing the right job because if you don't pay attention to it and I start doing things that aren't legal, you're in just as much trouble as I am. You're the team at the top. When you're not working well, the whole company or the whole organization suffers. And so how do you fix, them, fix yourself, so to speak? Well, the first thing is to have a plan for some priorities. Now this McKinsey Quarterly, this was in the spring edition here of 2017, and I just took a snippet here. So they asked directors of a, of a top company, in this case, they call them a top, top team, they were asked to list the company's top 12 priori or 10 priorities. Well, they had 23 different ones. And only two were listed by all directors. So if I took three minor hockey associations in here and got all your directors seated at a couple different tables and asked them the same question, would I get the same answer? Probably not. It's much the same as where I'm a volunteer at our 125-year-old organization. We still can't do that. I'm so embarrassed. It's really hard for me to sit at that board table when we're all over the place. It is not fun for me at all. I thought, because I'm an old hockey guy, because of my background, I would be a director and I can make a difference. Holy lordy. <laughs> I'm not making a big difference. I'm one voice. That's been the hardest lesson for me to learn at that level. I'm one voice. And not as powerful a voice as I am, let's say, in minor hockey, which is, I have to adjust to that. And it's hard. And then in our own community, we're hosting the 2019 Canada Winter Games. You guys in Winnipeg have just gone through the summer games. They've done an amazing governance job. Unbelievable what they have done in two or three years to frame all the governance wants and boundaries that they want for the Canada Winter Games, the outcomes, all of those things are unbelievable. I'm in a 125 year organization. We aren't even in the same city as the Canada Winter Games group of people that have put together their program um, for the 2019 Canada Winter Games. And all around good governance all around good governance. My experience, most minor hockeys don't have state, stated and written priorities. Most directors don't agree or know or what priorities are most important. What's the most important thing we're gonna do this year? Most do not evaluate or reflect on their performance as an organization and when I talk about an organization, I'm talking about the board of directors. I'm not talking about your team and your players. Because we all evaluate them and we get feedback from parents on how well the coach did. But how about evaluating your board of directors? Do we run our meetings properly? Do we evaluate? Why are some athletes so successful in competitions and others are not? Why are some organizations successful and others are not? Why are individuals anywhere in our lives successful and others are not? And there's a lot of reasons for it, but in, in, in terms of the point I want to make, it's called self-reflection. So your best athletes execute on the ice in our case, 
And they do something and they are evaluating it immediately and they're making an adjustment. I think the best organizations as well do that self-reflection. Lessons learned, whatever it might be, so that we don't necessarily make the same mistakes or we say, man, if we just adjusted this this time, it would be that much better next time. But the idea of self-reflection or evaluation, call it what you want, you gotta get to that point. But you know, we don't wanna do that because you know it takes time and I'm tired, okay? So you're gonna, put, you're gonna put a certain amount of time into your sport or your association or your job, whatever it's called in minor hockey. And if it's 100 hours, it's 100 hours. Where you, and I'm just using because it's an easy number. Well, where are you spending your 100 hours? If you do your homework at the front end, okay, so when Don McKee and Bob uh, Caldwell and I go out and do our HP1 evaluations, et cetera, across the country, we're looking for a seasonal plan from the coach. If he doesn't have one, we're not gonna do the evaluation. And then we wanna see how his year is playing out. Is he doing the things he should be doing that are appropriate for Bantam or Midget kids? Okay. So wh where's your plan? Where's your priority? How are you evaluating? How are you looking back? But if you spend your time at the front end building that, then the last half goes a hell of a lot easier, excuse my language. But if you don't do this, okay, fine, you'll still continue on, but boy, this last part is, it's not a lot of fun. It's stressful, people are questioning what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, what you know and don't know. Okay. So it's the front end that's most important. So when we look, and I'm gonna make some references to team building here, coaches, if they do things fairly well in the first three or four weeks of the season, it's gonna be great. But if the coach doesn't do a very good job in the first three or four weeks of the season, I'm gonna make reference to what he, he or she should be doing in those first three or four weeks. If they don't do it, then you are dealing with the problems within four weeks. The coach is dealing with discipline issues, maybe parent issues now, and why is it? It's because we've got bad kids. It isn't because the parents are bad because what I'm doing or not doing as a coach. So, and I think it's much the same for an organization. What do you guys do at the front end to allow you to be successful at the back end? If you do it, re you don't even have to do it really well to tell you the truth, you don't. You just kinda gotta do it. It'll take a bit of a life of its own. <coughs> Yearly reviews. Three really points. The qual quality of your renew. How, how, are you, how are you making it better? Avoid ins insularity. Utilize insight and knowledge outside the Minor Hockey Association. It's really hard. I don't talk hockey with my family because I'm not the expert in the family. But and there's eight kids in my family, so when they start talking hockey, I leave because it's just not fun. They know more about it than I do. And I, I might be classified as an expert I'll, only because I've been here for so long. Um, but it's really frustrating, okay? If you, don't, if you don't know, bring in somebody to help you out. And nothing against junior hockey, but junior hockey or minor hockey is not junior hockey. Bring in someone that knows about working with kids, knows about coaching, knows about development, knows a little bit about governance to help you out, okay? Quality of your interaction. It's really hard sometimes to have the kinds of discussions at the board table that you need to have because I'm the expert and so you should listen to me. Wow, BS. We should have some dialogue about how we're working with our kids in our minor hockey association. Not listen to Rick, because he's some sort of expert from out of town, okay? Should be some dialogue. So when I go in and work with minor hockey association, I don't generally talk this long. It's, let's get to work, here's the question, start answering, start having some dialogue, the answer will come clear really quickly. So I do a lot more facilitation than, than, uh, than yakking. 
Quality of your direction, aligning priorities, strategic team goals, direction, developing, developing talent. Developing talent. How, how many of, of your associations actually think about um, recruiting directors? So when we get up a, a little bit higher, so for example, Hockey Manitoba or the association where I volunteer, we have a skills matrix when we're looking for these kind of directors depending on what our, what our focus is uh, for the next three years. Oh geez, we're gonna go into a construction phase so we need more people that have project management experience or maybe big construction project experience on our board. So we, we, um, we have our plan and then we look at the directors we need in any one three year period of time. I worked with an association over the last five, five six years in, in Alberta who went through a lot of difficulty. And it was so difficult that the auditors for the national insurance company had to go in and spend a week to audit the Minor Hockey Association. So it only takes, as we all know, one guy or one lady <laughs> in your Minor Hockey Association to rip you apart. One person that's just good enough to write letters to cause enough havoc. Okay. When the auditors went in, they found nothing's a problem. No, no issues with, with male coaches and female athletes. There's no financial issues. Everything is above board, but one person, can, it doesn't matter how well you run in your organization, one guy can cause you a lot of upset. So you need to have things in order. Now they had some things in order. I came in after the auditors. We did another evaluation, um, more program related and planning related in terms of what I do. And now we've rebuilt the organization. So they invested over the, the five years a lot of money. Not that I charge a lot of money, but if they spent $60,000 over the last five or six years, <clears throat> great group of board members, but after six years, they are burned out, let me tell you. So the bulk of them have left. So out of whatever 12 directors coming into this association, there's only three of them that are left from the previous three or four or five or six years. And so I'm, we did a, review of our strategic plan, updated it with new people in June, and then we came back at the end of July and did an orientation session with our board of direct, new board of directors. Awesome, it went, I mean, I was hired in a kite. Couldn't have gone better. And a lot of the new discussion was around coach mentorship. They're gonna hire a guy and they're gonna spend $100,000 on coach mentorship. So it's a, it's a larger association, one of the six larger associations in Alberta, I'll leave it at that. I'm gone a week or 10 days, I phoned back because they had some tasks to complete to build this coach mentorship program. So how's it going? Well, the president's already hired his own guys. So it's a, it's a little bit like Donald Trump now. Well, it's great to have all those rules, but I'm the president, we're gonna do it this way. So I just say, holy lordy, you guys just went through hell in the last eight years, and now you wanna go back and start again? What's the deal here? So I'm not sure how it's gonna play out, but it's sure frustrating uh, for somebody that, that uh, we go in and we grow an organization, help the people understand the things they need to do to be successful, and they throw it all out of the window, and the president does whatever he wants. Now I'm hoping <laughs> that the, the role and responsibility, job description, terms of reference, whatever we want to call it for the president, is tight enough that he's gonna be held to account, but if no one holds him to account, what's gonna happen? So it's, for me, that's kind of frustrating. Okay, top performing teams. Common direction, shared understanding of goals and values. So do you have a common direction in your minor hockey association? That should be, if you have a vision and a, and a philosophy, that has to be part of your orientation of new directors. You must have an orientation program. Not great, hey, you're the new director, our first meeting is next Monday. Your first meeting should be about what we're all about and then talking about roles and responsibilities and expectations. Then we'll get into the meeting of the, of the work. Skills of interaction are crucial for hop, top teams. So whether it's a, your minor hockey team, your peewee team, is the coach a director, 
telling what to do all the time? Or does he engage with the kids? Does he engage with the parents? Or at your level, do you engage with each other? Or just listen to President Rick because he has it all and he's the expert and he gets mad when you question what he's doing. So the quality of your interaction, you need to get to a higher level. Top teams must be able to renew themselves. So I'm tr just trying to think of an oh, example. So it's coming up election time. So in Red Deer, you know, no different than here, public school board, separate school board. You know what the biggest issue is in the community? Is you three guys have been on the public or the separate school board, like you're into your fifth term, you're 75 years old. What are you doing taking up that spot? So the quality of renewal in our school system in Red Deer is not good. Why? Because us old white-haired guys don't get out of the way. I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious. I don't want to get out of the way. I think I have a lot to offer. So I always kind of uh, have, I look carefully at my involvement today. I want to, my kids are all grown up. I want to coach. I want to be like Bob who tells me he can hardly wait to his kids another year so he can go back and start at the initiation program again. I want to do that too. Or coach at the Adam B level or something like that. But that's my need or my want. But is it really best for the community for me to do that? It'd be good for those 18 kids. But what about you two guys? You want to coach your kids. So if I coach now at my experience level and I'm taking away an opportunity for these two guys to coach their kids, which is a pretty neat thing too. Every dad wants to coach, well, I like to think every dad wants to coach their kids, but it's not easy. So, can of winter games as well going on in Red Deer. I've got a sport administration background of 40 years. The CEO in Red Deer, I hired, and he took my spot at Hockey Alberta a long time ago. And why come you're not working for the can of winter games? Oh, I'm at the end of my career. Why would I take an opportunity away from a 38 year old or 36 year old? to gain a Canada Winter Games experience and then be set up in his career for the next 15 or 20 years. So me, I'm kind of conscious of that all the time, but top teams must be able to renew themselves. The success of your organization is in the movement of people. Now I understand when people say, well, there's no one else is stepping up, so I got to stay in. Well, people will always step up when there's a, there's a hole. So sometimes you just have to get out of the way and somebody will step up. It's not always the best way to get a new president or a vice president or a development coordinator or whatever director you're looking for. Time, time. In the mid-90s in Alberta, and this was really the bulk of what I wanted to talk about here, is we did some workshops with the Hockey Association and they said, and and um, um, it was referred to last night as we want, you said, we want training and development just like, like our coaches get, our referees get, our players get. There isn't a lot of development for you in this game. There's a little bit of develop development going on here, but there's a lot more development going on. So I was frustrated in Hockey Alberta because of great Hockey Canada, great programs, Hockey Alberta, great programs, Hockey Manitoba, great programs. And then we hand them off to you to implement. And so I left my cushy job, it wasn't that cushy back then, and went in to be self-employed to help minor hockey associations implement the programs the upper levels were designing. And that's what I spent the last 18 or 19 years doing. Uh, it was post-Olympic Games, or back then lots of issues in our insurance. I don't know why you pay for liability insurance now, 25 bucks, back then it was 80 cents. When I went to 96 cents, the country went off the deep end. Okay. Um, abuse and harassment issues, the Graham James situation, all of those kinds of things really forced us to do more with minor hockey associations about getting your side of the ledger in better shape. So we took a look at how the game was played out and we went to the University of Alberta and talked with uh, a man and his wife who were taking their PhD and they had a theory called pinch theory and it was, 
they were they were into uh, couples that were getting going to get married and and the amount of conflict uh, with young couples and they called it pinch theory. So the guy I was working with, Rick Matishak, at that time, we said, okay, well, let's take pinch theory and apply it to hockey. Um, and so, you know, when there is no vision, no philosophy, no stated values, no principles, no written plans, we don't communicate, no expectations, well, what happens? Well, there's a whole bunch of question marks. What is the role of minor hockey coaches, parents, players? I, I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to do. Okay. We get into player evaluations, team selections, play practice, etc. All the little things that happen are called pinches. It's a little bit like being married at times. Um, you know, us guys will do things. We don't always know that we're doing these things and we cause some upset um, with our wives. Those are little pinches. Okay. And I'll, most often, they're around expectations, okay? When situations happen, so pinches happen, a disruption of expectations, roles and goal clarity, little pinches. So enough pinches add up, somebody has to make a choice. So in our case, um, we get into a crunch point and there's four choices that are, are made, but before we get to that crunch point in minor hockey, Anxiety, resentment, blaming, guilt, anger, strong stance on issue, uneasiness, all of those things happen. Whether it's the parents on a hockey team unsure what's happening with the kids, or whether it's parents trying to appreciate what's going on with minor hockey. But at some point in time, there is a choice to be made. And there's four choices. A stalemate, meaning, well, you got that coach and team because we don't, no one else is stepping up to the plate. Okay, or we're just volunteers. Okay, we, so we just go back into this little cycle of, well, this is what we did and this is why we did it. But it doesn't really solve the issue. So it's a stalemate. Or unsatisfactory reconciliation is which most of where minor hockey issues go to. No one's really happy. But it kind of goes away. Kind of goes away. And then there's other two things. I can appeal things and take you to Manitoba minor, uh, amateur hockey. Uh, I can go get a lawyer eventually, all of those kinds of things. Or I just take my kid and leave hockey. And I built this model in 1995. So like that's, that's a few years ago. What's changed? The more I work with minor hockey, so nothing's changed. Why? Vision, mission, values. What are your values? And so I said, okay, well, then let's do the reverse. And, and I won't go through that. But when we do have those things and we go through the process, so it's not the answer, it's the process that's valuable. So when I'm a coach and I engage my parents, I engage my players, that's a process. That's what leads to happiness. Same as your minor hockey association, when you engage your coaches to help make your coaching program better, when you engage with your parents, when you engage with each other, it's much easier. And I'm saying there are opportunities for problem solving, conflict resolution, open, honest discussion when you've gone through that process. We expect teams to have a team building process. Well, what's your team building process? Is your team at the board? You should have some team building. Boy, I needed more time here. Um, I take a two-pronged approach to growing organizations, have a governance side, so that's where I spend all of my time now, men mentoring organizations on the governance side, helping you get your stuff in order. When I first started doing this, I also had a team side and we said, we gotta show coaches how to build a team because they don't know how to build a team. They're too busy telling and directing. Okay. And then on your coach mentorship, there's gotta be classroom and on ice support. If 
I were to come into your association and kind of rebuild your organization, it's going to take three years. If you don't have bylaws that are up to date, you don't have a vision, stated values, and how you're going to put things in place, it's three years. It's a year to build it. So when you'll see, I've started early in the year, March of April of 2017. We'll set a vision, we'll do an evaluation. We put some things in place through the summer. We oriented our board. We implement it in the next season. And then we evaluate. That's two years right there. So if you're going to invest in your organization, be prepared that it's going to take more than a weekend. Okay? Each one of those days is about 10 to 12 hours to get that done. So you're looking at one, two, three, f four sessions of a Friday, Saturday night. So maybe it's about 48 to 50 hours to go through and rebuild your organization. It is a commitment. Okay. End point of your effort, three to five years, mission, what are you doing to achieve? What are you doing? What are you gonna do to make your program better. And then values, the way we work together. How are they demonstrated? And we talk about respect and inclusion. What are your coaches doing with respect to respect and inclusion? Okay. I want the SWOT analysis is, a, is a, something we use in strategic planning, but you can use it everywhere in your association. This is a tool you should be using every single year. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Take your association. If we were in this room and you were going to do it, I'd put a couple flip charts over there as your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Divide you into four. Tell me what the strengths of your organization are. Tell me what the weaknesses are. What opportunities do we have? What are the threats to your organization? And threats right now are academies and sports schools. You might, some of you are going to be out of business in the next 10 years because of those. So how are you going to deal with it? We use the SWOT analysis in Alberta for all of our coaches. Three coaches coming together, well, what do you bring to the table? What opportunities do we have? What do you want to learn as an assistant coach? Okay, that's the process of team building, getting to know each other, understanding what we bring to the table. Group development theory, my whole program is built on this, that there is a process by which how people come together. The forming stages is the first few days. For the hockey team, it's the first 10 days of your, of your program. For board of directors, it's your first meeting or two, or maybe it's your orientation session. We're forming together. Why are we here? What's my role? Storming stage is when you question everything. That happens. On your hockey teams, that will happen between the third week and the fifth week. So if the coach doesn't do his job in the first three weeks, you're in trouble by week four, I'll guarantee it. I will guarantee it. He has not done his team building. And if he's just ad-libbing, he's definitely in trouble by the third or fourth week. Now these presentations, you don't need to copy this down. You can, I can either email it to you, but I think Manitoba plans on emailing these to you as well. Norming and performing. So there's various parts that go with each one of them. If we understand how groups come together, we can do the right things at the right time. That's leadership. Coaching development, group development theory, feed them and support them. You gotta feed your coaches. You gotta train them. You gotta feed your directors. You gotta train them. I know I'm, I'm getting the pressure here. I can feel it on the backside. Program expectations, what do you expect to happen at the novice level in your community? What do you want coaches to be focused on? Or at the peewee level or the Bantam level? Okay. Long-term athlete development model, we've been talking about that for 25 years. How come it isn't being used? Okay. I love it when I hear what Manitoba is doing. Okay. Appropriate training and appropriate environment. Coaching the female athlete. So I've got lots of experience coaching the female athlete. The guys I hang around with, I'm the only, I've been married 35 years this summer, but the guys I hang around with them are all on their second and third divorce. <laughs> and so you guys need to learn to work with the ladies and maybe <laughs> learn how to talk and listen and those kinds of things. But 
bring in somebody in your community to help your coaches learn how to work with young girls. If you got a male coach who thinks that girls should be reflecting after the game and thinking about what went right and what goes wrong, well, you're in trouble. Because they're going to be singing and dancing and the music's going. So, okay. You got to talk with every single girl every single day. And that could be just, hey, how's it going? How's school go this week for you? Great, because if you don't talk to them, they're going to think something's wrong. And then you've got more issues to deal with. Now, and I don't mean that to sound negative, but us guys don't know how to work with your girls sometimes. Um, and I've been married for 35 years, and I'm still figuring it out. So, um, but there's lots of people with some expertise. Your male coaches need, how to, need to know how to work with young girls. And if you do, it is really, really rewarding working with girls. Because if you like to coach and you like to teach, they are sponges. They really are. But you got to work it. You got you to know how to bring them out. And it is fun and rewarding. Okay, in summary, these things to bring away. If you do these simple things, you will be very successful. Your role and responsibilities as a director, clear roles and expectations. You got to be intentional about growing your organization. Intentional about growing your coaches. Don't leave it for Hockey Manitoba to, to grow and develop your coaches. That's your job. Self-reflection and resetting or refocus. Have a plan and evaluate often. Okay, We're not enough evaluation. And live your values. Whew. I always have so much to get out, you know, there's so much th things to share. Have a bit of a plan, it doesn't need to be a detailed strategic plan that we might have at, at Winnipeg Minor Hockey, but if you're Sanford or you've got 40, 40 players in your community, what's your plan? One, to keep those players, but how are we going to get more, okay? <coughs> A load of tools, they're easy to use, but you gotta use them. I'd hope when there was gonna be a handout, I had a whole bunch of physical tools to give you, but if you send me an email or something, I can send you uh, templates for going through a, a planning process or a template for evaluating your organization, a template for building a job description or terms of reference for a board member or a committee, and I can get rid of half that work for you. But the most important part isn't taking what I give you and saying, okay, great, this is awesome. The important part is having the dialogue and the process in your organization. That's where your success is. Just as it is on the team level, it is at your level. Thank you for your time. I hope I left a couple of tidbits.